Okay. Well, now we just saw how the background went in. We saw the the approach, the the walking through of five to seven big shapes. Excuse me, putting in the buildings, the oak buildings, looking to sort of balance that, creating that energy. Notice that there's virtually no information in, in any of those background shapes. I mean, precious little, if any. There's some scraping into there, and that's fine. The backdrop is just the curtain. That's just the curtain on which you hang your focal point. And it doesn't need to be about the backdrop. That is just there to provide that back surface. Like I say, just that background curtain. Everything happens in front of the background. At least it does in my paintings. So at this stage now, I think what I'm going to do, I'm happy with the background. I'm not 100% sure on my figures, but I think what I want to do now is I want to go and start making it snow. I want to put a layer of snow onto here. And I also want to go back in with some of my opaque white and start trying to create that rhythm of white, those little small white shapes through the painting to kind of give you that, that sort of a staccato feel, give it a little bit more energy. And I noticed that the building's a little on the, a little on the drab side for, for my taste. Again, I'm not a, a colorful painter, but I still might want to try to warm that up a little bit. And we'll go through that stage. We'll have a look at that and see where we are. Once that's done, we'll put the studio mat onto that to get a look at how those edges play out, see if there's anything that we've missed. And we'll make a decision on the figure. All right, let's go back to work. Background's dry. Checking with the back of my hand to see what kind of moisture is in there. Remember, always use the back of your hand over your fingers because the oil on your fingers will leave spots. Like that one right there. Right there, nice little fingerprint for the CSI people. So I'm reasonably happy with this right now. I did lose some whites up into here, so let's try to get those back. I'm gonna come in with my little bit of gesso. This is just a package of orange post-it notes that I have on here. And I don't wanna put the, pardon me, I don't wanna put the gesso on my palette any more than I have to because then if it just dries, then my palette can get all screwed up into there. So I don't want to do that. So I'm just going to come back in here, play a little bit, adding some of these whites that had gotten lost. I'm going to add just a few little dots and dashes along here just to kind of put some of those shapes back up again. I never ever use masking fluid. I prefer a white paint. Again, this is an acrylic gesso, water soluble. I could use a Chinese white or a white wash. I prefer gesso because when it dries, it's permanent. It doesn't lift off. It's not gonna get milky if I glaze over top of that, like Chinese white or white gouache has that potential to do. Also, the white gesso that I use, and it's a Liquitex brand, and I'm not sure if that makes any difference, is a blue white and it very closely matches the bright white of my watercolor paper which is why I choose the bright white from Arches because it has that bluer feel than the standard. So when you get splashing and you get throwing your paint down around here it's always hard to preserve all those little white bits. So this is just a question of me giving myself permission just to reintroduce some of these whites to create that rhythm. All right, I like this. I've lost a few more whites than what I wanted, but we'll come back into here and we'll play with that as, as we carry on. I wanna get back into here very, very quickly. Again, with that same combination, which is basically going to be sepia, burnt sienna, a little bit of red, and I want to try to darken that area, and I think 
I want to start separating those two buildings because they flow together here nicely. So either this side is going to be darker or that side is going to be darker. And I'm thinking that I want to have this side dark. Playing a little bit. Let's try a bit of a lift. And we'll just blot that. Never wipe when you're lifting. Separates those two. So here we have a good separation. Plane change equals value change. Go back in around here. I want to start relating this red just a little bit better. I'm just going to come in here and we're just going to ugly all of this up. I want to drop some of these values. And I want you to pay attention also while we're here, if you could please, just look what's happening to those scratches that we had put in here and how they're showing up dark. Little spray bottle to help move things around a bit. There we go. I want to take some of this dry brushing and I want to try to overlap some of that white just to create that sense of distance. Heavier mixture, much thicker. And we'll come in on this side here and we'll do the same thing. Despite the fact that I use an opaque white, I do try to pay attention to the whites that I'm leaving behind because really they are, there's nothing better, truly better than those in a watercolor painting. And I don't want to dismiss them without just cause. But I'm also not going to be bound by them and as I've said before I'm interested in only making the best painting that I can so if that means that I take some liberties with what with the tradition of watercolor and in doing so I have a stronger image so be it for some I would might even be considered a breath of fresh air or somewhat liberating in the way I paint. And for other people, I might even be considered the devil incarnate. It's hard to say. It depends on where you're, where you draw that line. And that's a line you'll draw for yourself. It's not one that I'm going to draw, certainly, obviously. And in my world, it's not one that anyone else should draw for you. You are in control. This is your painting your statement. It's hard enough figuring out what it is that we want to say, let alone using someone else's words or someone else's rules. And again, I'm not being, I don't see myself as being disrespectful. I just see myself as being me and that's just the way that I paint. So spray bottle again, softening some of these things up. How many paintings do you think really could have been absolutely wonderful? absolutely drop-dead gorgeous if we had only given ourselves just that little bit of permission to add those extra little bits of white into it just to clean up that roof line or establish just another little bit of white up into here how many I wonder how many we would have saved if only hey eh? what I am going to do right now I've got enough moisture in here and I think this is okay to do it at this time. A little bit more white and we're going to make it snow. And as I do this, I want you to pay attention to how I am making it snow. I don't use a toothbrush. I use this tulip brush, which is just like a beat up number 10. I'm going to bring the camera up on this one here just so you can see this thing. It's actually really quite, quite an interesting little critter. So, this is probably was the number 10 brush at one point and I've abused it horribly over the years and it really doesn't do much 
good for anything except for scumbling and, and spattering and things like that. But I rely on this for my snow and all of my spatter. And I got the name because one of my students said, gee, that kind of looks like a tulip. So I kept with that and I thought that's what I refer to as my tulip brush, but it's just a really, really badly, badly abused, probably number eight round at one point. Not that you'd ever see it for that, but I prefer using this to a toothbrush because I find that a toothbrush gives me all those little tiny dots and they're all roughly the same. Now pay attention here where it's still damp and how these spots are softening because there's a little bit of moisture into there. I got maybe a bit too much water in my gesso so it's reacting with the water on the paper but that's all right. And I'm tapping my brush. All right, we'll pull back on this one here. So I'm going to hit my brush. Tap my brush all over the paper. So I'm hitting this. You might be seeing this, which means you're going to get these long streaks of spatters up into there. So I tap my brush. I don't hit my finger. I hit the brush. So you'll see these, these colors, these whites are a little bit more vibrant on camera than they are in my painting. Now, just as it's drying here right now, we're going to take a few moments. I have what's called a studio mat. So this is a 22 by 30 piece of paper that we're seeing here in front of us. And I have a studio mat that I like to play with. And it cuts the the painting down from a 22 by 30 to an 18 by 24 window. One of the things in watercolors that we have it over any other medium is that we have the ability to take a knife or a razor knife and cut this. We can crop this so easily. So if I like this at 18 or 22 by 30, that's fine. If I like it at 18 by 24, then that's fine too. So I want to look at that and I see a couple things here, particularly as they show up on camera, that this white is just too darn white. So I'm just going to come into here with a little bit of dry brush and I'm just going to scuff that up there a little bit. I just want to put a few marks onto that, uh, whether it's the old tin or bar, I'm uh, not bark, sorry, not bark, but uh, rust, there we are, on there. This guy here is too pretty. So I'm just going to ugly that one up as well. And I want to keep those shapes, but I don't want that strong, strong white value onto that. So I'm going to bring in a little bit of detail into here. Let's take some dirty water. And I'm just going to, again, keep the shape, but I'm going to change the value a little bit so it's not quite so strong. And same thing into here. So. I do want to come back in with some darker trees back up into here and we'll do that once this dries. At this point, I want to look and say, gee, do I even need a horse and rider onto this? The studio mat helps me figure out what my edges are doing. And I think I'd like to have this. Oh, golly, come on. I think I want to pop that right over the edge there. So as I do that, the first thing I want to notice, I want to look at the distance from here to here, is that the same as from here to the edge? So it's pretty darn close. So this building appears to be sitting or splitting the middle here. I don't want that. It's not bad, but I think I could probably do a little bit better and that would just... And maybe just set it right about there. Now I'm not going to make any decision at this at this point because I want to put some trees back up into here. I may or may not put the riders in there. I think I'm going to have to because otherwise it's not a gray and flat painting if you don't have the riders, right? But there we are right now. So we've got the backdrop in talking five to seven shapes. I have one is my blue, two is this white, three is this mass, four is this foreground into here, five is all of this negative white, this stuff that's all been left over, and six really is my buildings. This is all sort of one big shape. I can connect all of that with some white very, very easily. So one, 
two, three, four, five, six. This one helps balance it, but it's really not a major shape. It's very, very effective where it is, but it's not a major shape. So I try to keep these things very simple, very quiet, not a lot of detail. I don't need that. I don't need that. You might, your choice. Anyway, we'll let this dry and then we'll pick that back up and see where we are.